Okay. So welcome everybody to the Saint class. It is Monday, February 19th, and I'm going to take you through uh, my understanding of Saint Damien. Um, I'll take you through the, the life, the spiritual challenges, the worldly challenges, and also the path towards sainthood. Um, so uh, let's begin. We'll start, uh, I think, let's start with an opening prayer um, so we can kind of get ourselves settled, grounded, brought into the space to welcome the energy of this saint uh, and any learning and uh, absorbing of information that we need. So um, here we go. Mother, Father, Masters, Jesus and Mary, all those saints and helpers of our souls, we invite you to join us here in this discussion that we may absorb the energy, the inspiration, the movements and understanding from your life here on this planet and the work you continue to do to help us and help all of humanity. We remain open and welcoming your presence with us today. We ask this in the name of the Creator, the Mediators, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So these two images are St. Damien at 33 and St. Damien towards the end of his life. Um, so I'll start off with the, the life of St. Damien. Uh, he was born in Belgium in 1840, uh, born Joseph de Wooster, or Jeff as he was called, in a rural Belgium. The seventh of eight children, uh, in a very devout Catholic family. He uh, had an older sister, uh, Eugene, who uh, joined the convent. Uh, and he also had an older brother, Auguste, who uh, joined the, um, the order that he would join uh, eventually. Um, and uh, at 19, he joined the... Um, formation of the Congregation of Sacred Hearts of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Up until then, his family, his father was a merchant, his mother was an innkeeper. You can see the uh, the family home he grew up in, I believe was also used as their inn. Uh, he had not been destined for a life in the ministry, although with an older sister and a brother already moving in that direction, he desperately wanted that. Uh, and as he grew older, he felt that calling coming to her, towards him. Um, life in the um, rural Belgium at that time, at the mid to late 1800s, was difficult. Um, he was baptized at birth due to the low infant birth rate, uh, or the sorry, the low infant birth expectancy. Uh, most infants didn't leave, uh, live past one year old at that time. Um, his old, older sister, Eugene, entered the convent when Jeff was two. Um, and unfortunately, she died of typhus when he was 14, uh, which, she, which she contracted while preparing a young girl for confession. Um, Jeff's favorite sister, Pauline, immediately volunteered to take Eugene, Eugene's place. Um, and that, uh, that decision informed Jeff in later years. Um, Jeff's older brother, August, uh, became known as um, Father Pamphile. And uh, they would communicate and uh, support each other throughout Jeff's life uh, as he moved on to into service. So at 20 years old, after following his brother into the uh, Sacred Hearts order, he took his vows and became Brother Damien. Damien was uh, a martyr, I think, from the 13th century. Um, this picture here, um, there's a few poses of him at this time. I think he's trying to emulate um, St. Francis Xavier's picture in this uh, this photo. So 20 years old, uh, convinced his parents or just told his parents he's not going to follow in their footsteps. Um, as a younger child, he did get quite a bit of training in Euro Belgium to, to just be a lay person. Um, learned a lot of carpentry and animal husbandry and um, the basics in rural life, um, which would 
dramatically help him in his later years. So in 1863, his brother Pamphile, Father Pamphile, uh, also contracted, which I believe was typhus, did not die, but he was unable to take uh, take on his mission. His brother had been uh, assigned the mission to support um, the budding Catholic diocese in the Hawaiian Islands. But with the brother sick, the ticket spot, uh, Brother Damien inserted himself um, and convinced the uh, administrators of the order to allow him to go in his brother's place. So in a way, you can say this was his first yes. Um, so he left in, I think, November of 1863. Six months later, he arrives in Hawaii. You can see this is him, um, I believe, at tw uh, 23. Um, and a few months later in, the, in Honolulu, he was ordained Father Damien. And he was given uh, a mission uh, to take up a parish, I work in a parish uh, in a place called Puna, which is in the island of Hawaii, um, which, which, where he would stay for several years. He was a very ambitious and zealous, uh, zealous. He was, he had a lot of zeal, let's say, and he, he was very ambitious to do, uh, do the work that he believed he was, a his purpose was for. Um, at that time, there were a lot of missionaries interested in bringing the word to far parts of the world. This was a time of new technology with steamships and steam trains connecting the world much faster than it had been connected before. And so there was, in a way, competition. Even in Hawaii, when he landed, there was already an Anglican order, uh, I believe Episcopalian order. And uh, towards the end of the 1870s, there was a, a Mormon um, mission there in Hawaii. And you can see through the letters, the great thing about this saying is there's a lot of re kind of recent information talking about his thoughts through the letters he wrote to his brother and his mother uh, and his superiors in the order. Um, so you can see from this that he um, had a lot of ambition to try to convert, try to um, try to convince people in the, the benefits of uh, leading a Catholic life, and especially uh, with so many challenges in the life in the islands at this time, to show them that their salvation, you know, rests in becoming Catholic, um, especially before their death. So leprosy. While uh, Father Damien was in um, the island of Hawaii doing his work, he did experience uh, the ravages of leprosy with his parishioners and the people of the community. Leprosy was a, a very, uh, it kind of ran rampant in this age in the, the Hawaiian Islands, and it was not understood. At the time, there was no cure. So um, the people and the government officials uh, had a great fear around this, this very um, horrific, mutating, and uh, often deadly almost always deadly disease. The Hawaiians had already, their population had been reduced dramatically through many of the other diseases brought to them, which they had no immunity to. Much the same story as you would find with others in um, you know, colonized areas in the West um, and the East. So leprosy was a, was a uh, real problem. And the um, government at the time decided they would pass what they called an act to prevent the spread of leprosy. Um, this was a very draconian act. Uh, at the time, this Hawaii was not yet a state, it was still a kingdom. So by the order of the king and the legislator, legislature, legislative assembly, uh, the Board of Health was, was authorized to uh, secure a land and isolate these lepers on this land. Um, and in, in that way, they've uh, created what is now the first and only leper colony in the U.S. Um, they also authorized their agents to uh, round up anyone with leprosy or alleged to be a leper or suspected to be a leper. And they also gave the Board of Health uh, and its agents the ability to deputize others to help round up people. So what this created, as you can imagine, was um, a lot of 
strife in the community as men and women, even children were taken from their families, suspected to be uh, lepers, not always the case. And then sent off uh, in isolation, often uh, never to return. So basically sent to their death for um, a disease they had no idea how, how it came, how it was passed. And as they knew at the time, there was no cure. Um, just to show you the um, kind of the opinion of the Board of Health, um, they say that um, the, the Hawaiians didn't appreciate, they refused to be convinced that leprosy was a communic communicable disease and that the leper is unclean and should be shunned. So you can see even from the official register, they see lepers as less than human. Um, they see it as a contagion, but there is not a lot of mercy and grace uh, with the treatment of these lepers. So as a result, uh, they had formed a leper colony in one of the islands. It was the island of Molokai on a peninsula called Kalopapa, and the settlement was Kalawa. Um, there's, in the end, there were two settlements, Kalopapa and Kalawa, both existing um, on this island of Molokai. As you can see from the map of the Hawaiian archipelago, um, it's in the middle. Uh, Father Damien was working in a, initially in a uh, parish in the island of Hawaii called Puna, and then later he would take on a much larger space um, called um, Kohala, the Kohala coast here. Um, just to flip back for a moment to Father Damien and his work on the, on the islands, while he was there in the island of Hawaii, meeting the locals, traveling with the locals, um, you know, traveling to them, very remote areas, many of them still living in huts and shacks. Um, he noticed how the, the people of Hawaii were very welcoming to him. Even if they didn't convert, um, they still accepted him. He, he slept with them. He ate meals with them. Uh, he, he traveled large distances to offer the sacraments, communion, last rites, and to offer baptism for those who would um, be willing to accept it. So he learned quite a bit of um, the Hawaiian people, and he started to gather a great fondness for them. Um, back to this leper colony. Uh, so the, the peninsula is here, Kalapapa. So this whole peninsula is where they sighted the leper colony. It had unique qualities as a place of isolation. Um, you know, the uh, surrounding surf was all peppered with uh, volcanic rock. So it was, um, although it, they did have a landing and they could dock ships, it was very difficult, especially in rough water, which often was the case on this part of the island. Um, so anyone that arrived uh, at the leper colony was essentially given a, a death sentence. Um, and the other quality of this, uh, this peninsula is there are 2000 foot cliffs preventing anyone from going to the other parts of the island, uh, at least not easily. Um, Father Damien later would be able to traverse these cliffs through some switchback trails, both on foot and uh, on horse and mule. But the lepers themselves with their deteriorating conditions um, had no chance of escaping this island and this colony. Um, leprosy often um, starts by um, creating numbness in the extremities, so the feet and hands become uh, oftentimes useless. So on uh, January, oh, sorry, yeah, January 6, 1866, um, the first load of leprosies uh, arrived at the settlement, the leper, lepers. There was nine men and three women. By October, there was 101 men and 41 women on the colony. Um, in 1873, now this is nine years after Father Damien had arrived in Hawaii. Um, he was, uh, they had asked, the Catholic, Catholic diocese had asked for volunteers to go to this island as there was no priest, no Catholic priest on the island at the time. They had proposed that the priest who go only stay for six months in a rotational basis because they didn't believe anyone who went there would want to stay. So this was their way of enticing some of the young priests in the order uh, to step up and uh, become the priest on the leper colony. Father Damien volunteered. He was the first one to arrive. 
uh, as a note in the first um, night, in the first several nights, he slept under what's called a Pu'uhala tree um, until he could build himself a proper uh, a proper uh, place to sleep. There was there was a church, there was a chapel. There were buildings on this island. The government had bought um, some dwellings and um, they had um, assumed that those people who took up residence on this island would immediately become self-sustaining, that they would take over the houses, they'd learn to farm, they'd feed themselves and care for themselves, you know, which in retrospect was extremely naive, uh, almost impossible notion given that leprosy is debilitating. Uh, when he arrived, there was approximately 500 lepers at the settlement. So this is a view of uh, both parts of the settlement. This Kalawao is the, the area where there were some buildings. This is taken after he arrived. This is a good example of what he would have seen when he arrived at the landing site. Just some grass huts. Some of the elders lived in uh, these thatched roof huts and small, small uh, dwellings, very exposed to the elements. Um, some of the people with more money or ha who had relatives with funds and resources uh, did take up residence in more um, uh, structures that were more impermeable to, permeable to the to the elements. This, um, even though it's Hawaii and it's a beautiful place, um, this part of the island was uh, or, or the islands was not very hospitable to anyone. Um, some of the um, some of the things I can tell you about what he saw when he arrived, I'll read from a, a passage of a book I'm reading. Um, this is from, uh, it's called The Making of Saint, Damien, The Making of Saint. He says, the Kalapapa landing place was at that time a somewhat deserted village of three or four wooden cottages and a few old grass houses. The lepers were allowed to go there only on the days when a vessel arrived, uh, they were living at Kalawa. All the other lepers, with a very few Kokua helpers, had taken their abode further up towards the valley. They had cut down the old um, Pu'uhala groves to build their houses, though great many had nothing but branches of castor oil trees con to construct their small shelters. These frail frames were covered with key leaves, sugarcane leaves, the best ones with grass, under which primitive roofs were uh, living pell-mell. Without the distinction of sex or ages or sexes, New or old cases, all more or less strangers to one another, these unfortunate outcasts of society. They passed their time with playing cards, hula, drinking fermented key root beer, homemade alcohol, and with all the sequels of all of this. And you can imagine the sequels of this. This is what he uh, encountered when he first arrived. He says, my poor people continually ask me for help, ask me to help them put up a few little wooden... Uh, houses. Most of them live there in their little huts, which those who still have intact hands and feet can build. The government supplies the framework, the mission provides planks, and then they're covered with grass or sugarcane leaves. I usually give them a hand for a few days, and lo and behold, they have accommodation. So immediately, Father Damien set to work to help them, help them build uh, structures to protect them, um, he eventually uh, put in uh, irrigation to allow fresh water. Until that time, there was no fresh water to these dwellings. Um, and he continuously struggled to secure resources, especially medical resources, to help these people in their suffering. Leprosy results in often with numb extremities, um, open bowl, boils and sores, which can be infested with dust, um, uh, bugs, and worms. Um, leprosy can result in uh, blindness um, when it reaches the face and also what they might have called elephantitis when there's enlarged organs like the, ear, the ears and the nose and things. Um, so I think I want to read from you. I'll show you the next slide. Uh, so this is the, I believe this is the church that Father Damien um, visited. I think he, this is a reconstruction. He constructed several chapels, several houses, um, and the, um, the church, uh, sorry, I forget the name, um, but this, this church that he constructed uh, blew down with the weather several times, and he had to reconstruct it and also expand it. 
Um, so after he arrived to this island, um, you can see that, well, maybe you can see, but these faces look in a way, um, maybe they look happier to me, they do. From what I've read, they're happy to have someone who's caring for them, who's looking after them. Um, still quite a difficult uh, place to live, um, but with Father Damien's help, they started to have hope again. Uh, many of the people said that um, initially when you were dumped on this island, um, you were dumped there to die. Um, there were boatloads that came to the island. Uh, the, the population of the lepers increased to um, over 700 after just a few years after he had arrived. Uh, between 100 and 200 died every year from their, uh, from their disease. Um, I'll read you another passage from another book that I've been reading. This is another book called uh, The Spirit of Father Damien. Um, Damien had prepared for the worst, but his first encounter with the leprosy colony was even more shocking than anticipated. The 500 lepers on the colony were in very bad condition. Many were in the final stages of leprosy, their hands, feet, and faces horribly maimed. The festering sores and lumps caused by the disease emitted an unbearable stench. Every day someone died from the disease. The body of the unfortunate victim was wrapped in the equally foul blanket on which the person had been lying. The wrapped blanket was hung from a pole and carried away by a few chosen lepers who still had sufficient strength. Often it happened that the dead were not buried deeply enough, and at night wild pigs would dig open the graves and eat the rotting flesh. Even the graves that were not ripped open spread a suffocating odor. Father Davian was overcome by the foul smell, and he quickly adopted the habit of smoking a tobacco pipe in the in the tents where he found the lepers uh, so that he could uh, administer his duties. Um, so just to give you a little bit more of an idea of the dire straits these people were in, um, there was a, an incident where um, there's rough seas uh, and there was a, a load of 50 lepers who had been rounded up brought to the colony and the ship's captain refused to uh, go to the landing. So he forced all 50 of these lepers into the water uh, to fend for themselves and swim for themselves. Father Damien and some of the other able-bodied people uh, jumped into the water and uh, brought them to shore, those who couldn't help themselves. And I believe four of the 50 perished in that incident. So as you can see, many of the people in the opinion at that time was these lepers were a lost cause. They were less than human and they weren't deserving, deserving any kind of human dignity or assistance. Um, of course, this made Father Damien very upset, but he put his energy in um, comforting them and supporting them, um, building shelters for them. He struggled with um, never having enough resources, always having to beg for resources from the diocese or from the government. He would often send letters to his family, to his brother Penfield and his mother and the uh, um, superiors in the order. His brother uh, decided to publish some of these letters, at which time Father Damien quickly uh, became famous for his careless, or sorry, his tireless efforts towards supporting these, these people. Um, and that did bring resources. Uh, donations were funneled in, clothing, but it also brought some um, bad will from his superiors, believing that he was bypassing them, creating a story, making them look bad that they weren't supporting him enough. So there was some tensions between uh, those uh, who he reported to. As he moved through his work, using the strength, he was a very strong, robust person, as uh, using his knowledge from his rural time in Belgium, building homes, um, and so and and also doing his work as a priest, um, he had uh, spiritual challenges of his own. Uh, after the first six months, he volunteered to stay permanently, and he was allowed to do that. So he was the only Catholic priest there for most of the time um, that he was on this colony. 
his spiritual challenges included um, not being able to confess. He didn't have a conferee, someone who he could um, make his confession to. So he would also often just make the confession at the altar of the church, which he was building and improving. Um, there was an instance instance where um, his father from the order, the superior, um, came to, uh, in, uh, intended to come to Molokai, to this settlement, um, and support him to offer, uh, allow him to offer, uh, to give confession. But upon arrival, that ship's captain also decided that um, this person could not come ashore, and they wouldn't let Father Damien on the boat. So Father Damien had no alternative but to offer his confession from the little boat to the big steamship that was uh, that was moored to it um, in front of all the passengers. Um, and I believe he offered to do it in French to try to minimize the what you could imagine would be um, quite an embarrassment. Um, but he was so desperate for uh, confession. He did that without shame, as I'm told. I'll give you one other uh, story. Um, about the um, so Damien was allowed to uh, to leave periodically and go to Honolulu um, and confess and and um, have discussions with the the diocese leaders as well as some of the government officials, which he found very useful. Um, but that was very infrequent. There were these lifts uh, as as there's outrage into the the treatment of the people and not letting people in or on the island that weren't lepers they they loosen that and tighten that periodically so he was able to to move off the leper colony periodically so upon returning um let's see if i can find this passage We've got lots of notes. I think I may have told you, but he acted as a carpenter, a plumber, and also a grave digger. So Father Damien, with his strength and his carpentry skills, would often make coffins and dig the graves for the people who died. Um, there were times where, um, you know, in the beginning, there were um, people who were dying um, kind of all kept together in one one structure, one uh, shelter, and they weren't able to remove the dying people fast enough. So there were people who were dying and they were uh, forced to stay in this room with people uh, who had already passed. So Father Damien did what he could to increase the uh, number of structures to prevent that. But there was constantly um, a hammer going towards building these coffins. Um, so there's another passage. Despite Damien's desire for, if not curative, then at least mitigating treatments, the rally of Molokai was that omnipresent death uh, was everywhere. Owing to the continuous arrival of new patients, the number of inhabitants in the colony fluctuated between 600 and 800. The only thing that really grows here is the cemetery, he said. The pews in the church are somewhat emptier, while in the cemetery there is hardly room left to dig a grave. This was a letter to his brother in 1880. He was annoyed that they had even begun digging a grave on the spot that he had long reserved for himself, next to the church of, there we go, St. Philomena. With a view of the ocean, he insisted that they keep this favorite space empty. Um, bear with me as I find this passage. Damien also built uh, several orphanages. You can see here, this is the girls uh, towards 1880. Uh, he had a much larger uh, dormitories for the boys, um, but there were more boys than girls. 
I think in the end he had two dormitories for boys and two for girls. Um, this is a picture of him in his older years with the boys and some of the older uh, patients. Damien did not direct his attention only to the adults, but also gave special attention to the orphans. Every year, 10 to 20 children between 8 and 15 years of age landed in Kalapapa, unaccompanied by their parents. Damien knew that they were especially vulnerable to neglect and sexual abuse. In 1879, he built a shelter for 12 orphans. A healthy male kokua was responsible for food with support of the Board of, with support of, the board of Health. Very quickly, the facility was so attractive that other boys in the settlement that he had decided to build a second, bigger dormitory. The girl orphans likewise were entitled to protection and guidance. For them too, he built an orphanage with the support of the Board of Health. I can't find the passage, but he had returned from Honolulu uh, once and upon his return, there was a young girl who was dying and she had um, insisted that he provide her with the the Holy Viaticum, the uh, Eucharist for the last rites. And he said that upon um, saying her prayer, she, she gave up her soul to the Lord and he um, dug her grave and buried her that evening. And upon returning, he had learned that two other girls had also died. So this was kind of the reality of his life. He tried to make it a, a joyous place for them, a safe place, a nurturing place, but death was everywhere uh, in this place, and it was a reality. Um, in 1881, he was visited by the queen, uh, Lili Okalani, the queen regent of Hawaii, and she was so overtaken by the suffering, she offered to help and um, awarded him the Royal Order of Kalakaua. Um, he... He, he mentioned in a letter to his brother that night that he would be in the confessional till 9 p.m. Well, I can only imagine the reason um, probably was not happy that this medal meant nothing to him. He never wore this medal. Uh, it wasn't food or shelter or clothing. Whoops. We're all still here. Um, so this medal stayed on the shelf. Um, 1883, so this is now... Uh, Father Damien, uh, 43 years old, he had asked insistently for the uh, for some women to come, some sisters to come and help with the orphanage and help attend to the sick. In 1883, uh, there were Franciscan sisters who arrived in Honolulu, but the um, the clergy and the government felt they would be better spent uh, working at a leprosy receiving station in Honolulu. So even though he was able to get the the helpers to the state, he didn't get the help. Um, in 1885, at the age of 45, he was examined and it was determined that Father Damien did in fact have leprosy himself. You can see the, the sores on his fingers are starting to show up. He's hiding his other hand. Um, I think it had injured it at the time. And you're starting to see some evidence of leprosy on his face. Despite this, um, he remained in good spirits and extremely strong and active. He continued to build houses. He continued to convert. He continued to offer baptism and all the sacraments. This is just a note. Um, this uh, 1886, you know, right after he did receive uh, the notice that he had leprosy, he had always called, he had always said in all of his sermons, we lepers, he, he associate himself. He felt like he was one of these people, even though he didn't have leprosy for so many years. But in 1886, after he was diagnosed with leprosy, um, someone showed up, this brother Damien, sorry, brother Joseph, who was an extremely uh, useful helper to Father Damien as his health declined. Um, so he did get the help he needed when he needed it. Um, this uh, I mentioned uh, this Joseph Dutton, uh, just because he is now been um, petitioned to become a saint himself, uh, which would be the third saint in, in Hawaii. Uh, in 1888, uh, a storm blew off the steeple of St. Philomena's Church and immediately Damien, although diagnosed three years earlier with leprosy, uh, sets about to rebuild this steeple, which he does before his death. Also in 1888, uh, a woman named Mother Marian Cope 
uh, she arrived with two Franciscan sisters, which he thought was obviously a gift from God, even though late, right when he uh, could no longer do the work himself. At 49 years of age, uh, Father Damien succumbed to his leprosy. He was buried under the hollow tree where he slept when he first arrived. So this is 49 years of old, 49 years of age. Um, so at this point, I'm going to talk a little bit about Father Damien's path to St. Damien. Uh, in 1895, seven years after his death, a woman, a sister from the Sacred Hearts Order, Simplicia Hugh, she prayed to uh, St. Damien or Father Damien at the time and experienced an overnight cure. And she lived another 32 years. This was later determined to be the first miracle that would uh, sanctify him as a saint. Um, another note, 1936, as often happens with um, deceased people who become saints, his coffin, was, his coffin was exhumed. His remains were sent to Belgium where he was born. At the time, just as a note, a young woman named uh, Audrey Taguchi uh, witnessed this procession from the um, church in Honolulu onto the boat. And that's noteworthy, which I'll explain later. 1938, so this is now uh, 50 years after his death, beautification proceedings finally begin. Um, this took a while because there were challenges even after Father Damien's death. Many of the uh, people in Hawaii and elsewhere believe that leprosy was a advanced form of syphilis and therefore sexually transmitted. So they believe that all those people who contracted leprosy were um, unclean, unpure, and in many ways, indirectly, they would believe that they were deserving of this fate. And that was another harsh and false um, assessment that made uh, that added to the suffering of these of these people with the leprosy. In 1984, um, now almost uh, 96 years after Father Damien's death, Mother Teresa wrote to Pope John Paul II, uh, petitioning him to name Father Damien as Saint Damien as an inspiration to lepr lepr leprosy sufferers worldwide. As you know, she herself was uh, someone who worked with lepers. Um, in 1991, um, the Sister Simplicia, whose cure was accepted as a miracle, and that led to Pope John Paul II beatifying Damon, moving him one step closer to sainthood. In 1998, Audrey Taguchi, the young girl who witnessed Father Damien um, leave from the, um, the boat, his, his, his remains, she was diagnosed with incurable cancer. She traveled twice to Kalapapa to pray at Damien's tomb. And as a result, the x-rays um, showed that her cancer had disappeared completely. This miracle was formally recognized in 2008, 10 years later. And in 2009, so this is 130 years after Damien's death, he is canonized St. Damien um, by uh, Pope, uh, Pope Benedict. So with that, that is the um, story of his life. I thought maybe um, I mentioned a little bit about why I chose Father Damien. You know, here in Hawaii, um, there are a lot of people that come and go uh, to these islands. Uh, there's a lot of welcoming spirit. Um, there's a lot of people who still see uh, this island as a, because of its great beauty, as a, a fantasy place, one, uh, one of just pure natural beauty, which it has. Um, but also, they don't really see the reality on the ground. There are locals here that have suffered there for generations, who've lost much of what they had but they're also very welcoming they're very warm-hearted they're very open and kind and accepting and i believe father damien recognized that and he became one of them he became one of the people here and he wanted to extend that from a very ambitious young priest at 33 here on the left the age of jesus uh to an older man 48 um still not that old in today's terms but old enough to live a lifetime of service. And he noticed that the people were welcoming. He felt that he was one of them. And that's something that still resonates with me here today and with so many locals. We see that they don't always see the outsider as an outsider. They, they see people from their hearts. And also with all the challenges here on this island as a microcosm of the planet, 
from the people of the state. It's also true that maybe things have changed with leprosy, um, but in some ways, uh, so many people still need help. Those people that are marginalized or treated for less than who they are still need to be seen for their pure uh, intrinsic selves, which we all, of course, know know that to be true. I think with that, I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, allow us just to have a little contemplation. You can look at these two pictures and settle your eyes on either one or both of them. You can see the young, ambitious, determined Father Damien and the old, bullheaded, strong, open-minded and still caring Father Damien on the right. I'm going to ask, I'll set a quick prayer and then we'll enter into a brief contemplation. Uh, then we can we can share. St. Damien, I open this space for you to enter into our hearts, permeate our minds, share with us the insight, the essence, and the wonders and beauty you experienced helping the souls while you walked this earth and the work that's yet to be done for all the souls on this planet. Bring yourself into our space and allow us to feel your presence. I ask this in the name of the Creator, the Mediators, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I'll give us all a chance to share. I'll stop the recording.